start. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the ninth annual Harrisburg Book Festival hosted by the Midtown Scholar Bookstore. My name is Alex. I'm with the festival. And as always, I am live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, at the bookstore for our virtual events. Um, before we get started tonight, I'd like to give the book festival a solid plug here. We had our very first day of our outdoor tent sale with over 10,000 books priced at one, two, and three dollars, which will take place every day through Sunday of this week across from the bookstore in the grass lot. The bookstore cafe will also be open as well, and we'll be hosting a virtual event every evening through Sunday. If you're local or regionally located, we'd love to see you. This is a huge time of the year for the bookstore. It takes a lot of work and preparation. So please, please, please come out, support your indies, buy TJ's book, and we hope you come away with another book or three after this weekend. Um, but at this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers here this evening. Our interviewer is Catherine Budig. Catherine is an internationally celebrated yoga teacher, author, and co-host of the Webby Award-nominated podcast, Free Cookies. She graduated from the University of Virginia with a double degree in English literature and drama before moving to Los Angeles. With nearly two decades of experience in her field, Budig served as the yoga editor to Women's Health Magazine for five years, contributed recipes and sat on the Yahoo Health Advisory Board, was an athlete in Under Armour's I Will What I Want campaign, and regularly contributed to Yoga Journal, The New Potato, and Mind Body Green. She is the author of The Women's Health Big Book of Yoga and the best-selling book, Aim True. Off the mat, Budig founded and runs The Inky Phoenix and The House of Phoenix, a book club for lovers of magic and story, regularly co-designs fashion capsules for Kira Grace and is working on her first novel. She lives in Charleston, South Carolina with her wife, Kate Fagan, and their two dogs, Ashy and Kiona. Um, of course, uh, our featured author this evening is TJ Kloon. TJ is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling Lambda Literary Award winning author of The House in the Cerulean Sea, The Extraordinaries, and more. Being queer himself, Kloon believes it's important now more than ever to have accurate, positive queer representation in stories. Of course, uh, TJ's new novel that we're here for this evening is titled Under the Whispering Door. Love that cover. Uh, a couple blurbs here. Publishers Weekly says fans of queer fantasy won't want to miss this. And Cassandra Call writes that it's a warm hug of a book about a Grinch of a man. Um, some quick housekeeping before we get started. If you have a question for TJ or Catherine at any point, please use the Q&A button towards the bottom of the screen below our faces here. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So ask away at any point and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible towards the end of the program. Um, and lastly, most importantly, if you are interested in purchasing a signed copy of Under the Whispering Door, here it is once again, signed copy. Uh, we'd love for you to purchase it through the Midtown Scholar Bookstore. Uh, once again, that is the number one way to support the festival, this event series and the bookstore. For all of our festival books, we're offering free media mail shipping with discount code HBG Bookfest. So look in the chat room in just a moment and I'll provide a link there for you or simply head to hbgbookfest.com. Once again, signed copy is available. Uh, but now, without further ado, the Harrisburg Book Festival presents TJ Kloon and Catherine Budig. Hi. Hi. <laughs> TJ, oh my gosh. So Catherine. Oh. Oh. I got the email asking if I wanted to do this panel with you. Obviously, I did three backhand springs in my head. <laughs> I can't do that. But I just love you so deeply for someone who I've never met in person. I know, for real. Like, I adore you too for someone I've never met in person. And that's really <laughs> we'll, weird. We'll fix that someday and we'll have a couple. Yeah, we'll have to, yeah. We don't live that far away from each other. So we might as well do it at some point. Get on those things called planes. But yeah. how, okay, number one, how are you today? You know what? I am pretty good. I am, I am recovering after the last month of craziness in a good way with all the book stuff and, and, and leading up to the release and the aftermath of the release and, and watching everybody read a book that made me super nervous to have come out finally. And it's been good. It's been stressful, but you know, it's a good kind of stress. And okay. So you said nervous about under the whispering door come out. And I've been following you on your social posts. And I did notice that was a theme when you would post about it, that you were nervous about how this would be received. And is that because many, many people right now know and love you for the house in the Australian sea, which right. I am not saying this because I am on air with you right now, but hands down <laughs> one of my top favorite books of all time. It Thank is <laughs> a masterpiece and it makes my heart thump bigger even thinking about it right now 
but it, it is a big shift from the house mm -hmm. and the civilian sea. So was that part of what the nerves were changing gears to a book about death or? Yeah, in, in a way it's, it's, it's twofold. Uh, one, it was the fact that I enjoyed some pretty crazy success with the house in the Australian sea. And, and, you know, I, it was not my first novel by far, but it was the first novel that, that with a traditional mainstream publisher, and it was the first novel that many people had read by me. And so, and it's not necessarily indicative of every kind of book I write because I tend to, to adapt to different stories. And this, the house in the Australian sea was always meant to feel like a warm, cozy hug of a book. And I worried that if people's only experience with reading something I've written was The House in the Cerulean Sea, that they were going to get to Under the Whispering Door and not get the same exact feeling that they had in the, in the first book. Because the thing I try to do is I never try to write the same story twice. And, and I try to adapt to the type of story that I'm writing and, and the way the characters feel. So I, I worried, you know, and it's such a first world problem to have. Oh, people really like my first book. Are they really going to like my second one now? <laughs> but it was, um, it's, you know, you, you can never make every person happy with what you write. That's impossible. There's always going to be somebody who loves it, likes it, dislikes it, hates it. But I, I wanted to make sure people were abundantly clear that this book was not the house in this really scene. It was not meant to be. But the second part of that was this book is extraordinarily personal to me because of the subject matter having to deal with grief. Um, and you kind when you write something in every book an, an author puts out, they put a little piece of themselves in their in the book. It's just something that happens. With this, I probably put more of myself in this book than any other book I've written. And when you go to that kind of level, you have to divorce yourself from what you've written because when the book comes out it no longer belongs to you it belongs to anyone who wants to read it and i have to give myself that extra space because again not everyone will like this book and that's okay that's their right and i fully support that right but at the same time this book again was personal to me so i i was nervous about revealing a little bit more about myself because even though i do stuff like this and even though i've i've been publishing for 10 years, I'm still an intensely private person. And so to open this kind of window into my mind was a scary prospect. And um, I've been, I don't want to say dreading, but it's been very nerve wracking leading up to the release. But now that it's here, it's that, that whole thing that always happens. I It comes out and I feel this great weight off my shoulders and a sigh of relief. And I've done the best that I could. And this is the book that I wanted to, the world to see. Who was the first person and non-publishing agent editor related who read the final copy of Under the uh, That would be the probably my beta readers. I wrote I, they they've been with me for years and they they read the first draft and then they would read the final draft to just for my own peace of mind to make sure I'm not missing anything. And so there there are people whose feedback I value extraordinarily because they've never steered me wrong. And they said that they thought that this would be an important book, not just for me in trying to process grief the best way I know how by writing, but for other people who might be experiencing grief at some point. And it's not even about the grief that comes from death. There, there are big deaths in life and there are little deaths. There's big grief and there's little grief. We, we grieve all the time, whether we know it or not. And especially in the climate that we're living in now for the past almost two years going on now, we've been in this really weird stasis, this standstill. And the House in the Cerulean Sea came out right when the pandemic started. And this book is coming out, you know, all this time later. And if you told me back then that, that we would be still in this world <laughs> all in September and October of 2021, I wouldn't have believed it. But it's this strange bookend because you had Cerulean Sea at the beginning and you have Whis Under the Whispering Door now. And Cerulean, I've heard from a lot of people, became the hug that they needed during a really difficult time. And now that we have Under the Whispering Door coming out when it is now, it still feels like a weirdly prescient time for this book to come out because this book, I, I don't know how 
much we've allowed ourselves to grieve over the last two years, the time loss, the people loss. And I don't know what that's going to feel like when that moment hits, when if we if we ever get to go back to quote unquote normal, um, or if this is gonna be our new normal. And I don't know that we've had time to necessarily process that because we've all been hanging on by the skin of our teeth for, for too long now. And so this book is, the shoulder to lean on. It's not a hug. It's not meant to be a hug. It's the shoulder to lean on when you need someone to, to lean on, when you need somebody to tell you it's okay not to be okay every now and then. Yes. And I, I, I want to put a pin in, in the origin story and the grief that you were talking about, but just for listeners who haven't read this book yet, uh, could you give, I, I know people love this, but a little yeah. elevator, elevator pitch. Elevator pitch. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. So Under the Whispering Door is a book about a not so very nice man named Wallace, who is a selfish man. He lives only for himself in the bottom line. He's an attorney in his own law firm, and he runs it like a well-oiled machine. As the novel opens, he's firing one of his long-term employees for making a relatively minor mistake, because to him, uh, if a part of a machine is breaks down, it's easier to replace the part than it is to fix it. So he fires her and then he dies. That is the very first chapter. It's not a spoiler. It's all over <laughs> every part of this book. And when he dies, he learns that it's not an ending, but the beginning of something else entirely. And at his poorly attended funeral, he, is, he meets a woman who calls herself a reaper. And it's her job to take him to a tea shop, a very, very quirky, odd little tea shop that's run by a man named Hugo who also happens to be a ferryman whose job it is to help souls cross over to whatever comes next. And Wallace, being Wallace, decides that he's not ready to go. And he decides to stay in the tea shop for however long he can take it. And there he slowly but surely learns to, to become a better person because of the people around him and seeing and reflecting on his own life and what it means to be a better person, what it means to to do something for somebody else without the the without accepting accolades or rewards just for the sake of doing the right thing. And this book is funny, it is sad, and it is uh, what I wish could happen to all of us when we when we finally close our eyes for the last time, that we could be taken to a tea shop with empathetic people who want to help us become the best versions of ourselves before we find out what comes next. And I love your description of the house in the Cerulean Sea as the hug that everyone needed in this book as the shoulder to lean on. I think that's a perfect description. And you're, although I have to say, I think there is so much synergy between these two books for me personally, because you are so talented at writing characters with massive hearts. I mean, your characters have the biggest hearts and they, they just jump off of the page. And I found that in both of your most recent books that these were characters that I took around with me throughout my day. Mm -hmm. And I know you said a moment ago that, you know, this came from personal grief that you were experiencing in your own life. So I'm just curious when it comes to creating these characters, are you the kind of writer where, you know, you take little bits and pieces of yourself and spread them out through the characters or do you know, do they talk to you? Do you go to sleep and you have- Oh yeah. Yeah. And the, the very first voice I heard was Wallace. And, and if, if you know, if you've read the book or, or, or going to be reading the book, you'll know that Wallace is a very, to be frank, he's a dick. He's a bit of a dick. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I love, I love, even, you know, I don't think it could be ever overplayed. I love the idea of redemption arcs of, of people who are, eminently unlikable, finding themselves put in a position where everything they know and have used as armor has been stripped away from them. And so what is left? You have a two choices. You can either continue being the person that you were, or you can try to become a better version of yourself. And Wallace, he, he I, I knew that there was going to be something with this book when Wallace came through loud and clear. Like first, way back when, years and years ago, I had the idea for a book about the afterlife and the bureaucracy of the afterlife. There's a scene in the movie Beetlejuice 
Mm -hmm. um, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. When Alex um, Baldwin and Gina Davis's character first die, they go into basically uh, 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 a cubicle hell where they have to go meet with their social worker to talk about their death. And that idea has always fascinated me. So I was, I was thinking, man, I could write something about like the bureaucracy of death. And then as it sometimes happens, somebody had a better version of that idea and did it first, which became The Good Place, which is one of the best TV shows I have ever seen about the idea of death and the philosophy of death. And so when that came out, I was like, oh, well, they did it better than I ever could. So I'm gonna tank that. But after a while, um, I could hear Wallace starting to talk and it all came to fruition when I read um, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. Um, mm. It was the first time I've ever read it. I've seen adaptations before, but I'd never, I've never actually read the story it's based upon. And if you, hopefully everybody is aware of that, but if you don't, Ebenezer Scrooge is a jerk who uh, is visited by three spirits who show him the error of his ways. And at the very end, everything is wonderful and everything is good. And I just, I wanted to see the work that goes into becoming a better person because in the, in the, Scrooge's arc is that he's shown the bad things and then he becomes a good person. But I wanted to see what it, the work a person puts into becoming a good person. What would that look like? But especially if that person had no more power to do anything to change what their life had been. So that would mean that the, instead of uh, uh, a character like Scrooge seeing the error of his ways, what if a man like him died and was forced to shine a light on the type of person he was without the power to change that. And that is when Wallace came out screaming full force that he wanted to be written. Oh God, Wallace. I love Wallace. <laughs> <laughs> but man, did I love him in the end of it. Um, so that concept of becoming a better person is very interesting because for me, when I was reading your book, there's also, you really tackle not only becoming a better person, how difficult it is to be a person, period. Mm -hmm. Like just the, the human experience and then as a ghost in the afterlife, being able to absorb how challenging that was. And you just had a particular line, I'm, I'm working from the arc, but in the arc it's 202, where Wallace whispered, it's easy to let yourself spiral and fall. It is, Nelson agreed, but it's what you do to pull yourself out of it that matters most. And that line, I have a massive star next to it because I I also just have to applaud you with your transparency in your own personal life. I know you said you're very private, mm -hmm. but you've also been very open about your personal struggles with being human. Yeah, because it's very hard to be human. It is it's so hard to be human. And that I'm reminded, so in this book, it deals with uh, part of the book deals with um, the subject of death by suicide. It's never shown uh, on page because I, I that's sensationalist and I just don't Completely. I don't need to do that. It's not necessary. Yeah. But it is a subject that is touched upon. And I'm reminded of uh, uh, I believe it was a congressman or a senator's uh, child, the son uh, died by suicide. And the family released, uh, part of the note that he left and part of the note said I'm sorry but it is so very hard being human and I just it's it is it is so so hard being human because for all the good that we do for all the beauty and the magic and the wonder that is in this world there is such darkness there is such evil such such all around terrible people I mean all you have to do is turn on the news and you see it every single day. We are inundated with, with the fact that the world is on fire and we're told that we need to hate these people and that these people hate us. And I don't know, it's, it's, it, it takes a toll on a person. It absolutely does. And I have always been, I've always tried to be a huge proponent in, in ending the stigma surrounding mental health, mm -hmm. because the more we talk about it, the less power it has and the less frightening it could be and the more knowledge that everyone around us will have about what it means to struggle with mental health. And I've, I've had some, some extremes up and downs uh, this year, past few years, much like many other people have. But I find myself with a platform that I'm able to talk about it and that's hard to do. Even though I know it's important, even though I know it's right, it's so hard to do because again, I am private. I try to be, I try to keep 
as much of my life separate from my books and my my real life. But I mean, this is who I am both in real life and not, you know, <laughs> on, on stuff like this. But sometimes those those two sides need to merge, uh, for, at least for a little while. And I talk about things like grief and I talk about things like mental health because it's important because there may be one person who's watching or listening or reading who might be going this through this something similar, but it's too scared to say anything about it. And if I can help that person at least be on the path to find their voice, then I'll have done and everything I've set out to do. Oh my God. I, I completely agree. Just remembering that, uh, I think, you know, as Matt Haig said, depression is a liar. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such an important thing. And, and when you vocalize it or with anyone with a platform vocalizes the, the, the raw, dirty stickiness of being human and all the emotions that come up with it, it, it does give other people permission to realize, oh, that we are all feeling all this raw, sticky dirtiness mm -hmm. inside of us and struggling. And which brings me to the next concept, <laughs> of your, which is going to become my new motto. And it's the, the concept of unexpecting things. Mm -hmm. I love this concept so <laughs> much because I'm always thinking about, oh, you know, it's an unlearning. It's not so mm -hmm. much that we're trying to learn new things, but we're trying to unlearn the things that we've been taught, the implicit biases, the everything that has been packed onto us. And, and when I read this, and I don't want to spoil anything in the book, but it's something that a character needs to learn in order to figure out how to be as a ghost, I guess, is the way mm -hmm. of describing it. So I was wondering if you could explain where the concept of unexpecting something came from. Absolutely. So the, the idea of unexpecting something is basically what you said, the fact that we have to unlearn everything that, that we've been told was right, especially, especially growing up. I, I can't speak for anywhere else in the world, but especially growing up in America. And during the time that I did, I was born in the 80s, came of age in the 90s. And we had we had this idea of American exceptionalism. And it's still pervasive today. It, it, I mean, let's be honest, it's still something that, that Americans tend to think. But I, I wanted to, to find out what it would feel like if you had to unlearn everything that you've ever known because it no longer matters. It no longer, I mean, the big, the small, the, 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 the monumental things that you thought were so important at one point in your life, did it really matter? Did it really need the weight that you gave it? Did those harsh moments that felt like you were being gutted, yes, where they, they were painful and it sucked, but you lived through it. You made it. You are still here. And I think that we are, we are so conditioned to keep these thoughts and feelings to ourselves that, that people don't wanna hear about what's going on in our heads or in our hearts because it's really weird, like, like death itself, like grief, such things are almost considered taboo. And it's yeah. frankly disheartening that we, we think that or some of us, I should say, think that we're so enlightened, but we can't face certain things head on. We can't realize the truths that have been right in front of us. So with unexpecting, the concept is just the fact that you need to unlearn everything that you thought was true. Everything you thought was true that you told yourself was true, that you made yourself believe was true, mm -hmm. and face what reality actually is. All right, you might think this is a fun question. You might hate me for it, but let's go. <laughs> so you, without giving anything away, you know, it says so on the book, quote, what will you do with the time that you have left? Mm -hmm. And Wallace is given basically a week in death to again, have to figure things out. Yeah. So, and I would imagine as you were writing your book, maybe you thought about this. What would you do if you had a week left with the time that you would have left? I would spend as much time as I could with my friends and my family. Um, I would take my dog with me no matter where I went. If it was to the grocery store, my dog would still go inside with me, even though they probably tell me no. And I'd be like, look, I have a week left. I mean, my dog is coming with me to buy bananas. It's totally fine. Yes. And then I would honestly probably just get in my car and drive. I would mm -hmm. drive and go get lost on purpose. I would go find places that I didn't know existed. 
I would not follow any map. I would not follow any markers. I would just go find out and see something I've never seen before. And maybe on the way, still try to learn what it takes to be a not necessarily a good person, because I don't know if I know what that even looks like, but a better person. And I, I've always, I've, in the recent years, I've tried to live by the ideal of trying to become a little bit better every single day. Do I succeed every day? Absolutely not, but I keep trying. And so I'd like to think that if I knew that I had a week left, that I would still try. And, but I would also go out into the world and see things that I've never seen before, just so I could see, just so I can know to myself that I saw them. Oh my gosh. I'm going to, I'm going to do that. I'm going to steal it. I'm going to take my dog to buy bananas. Yeah, for real. And, and maybe we can meet up on the road somewhere. You definitely could do that. Uh, yeah. But thankfully we're going to live for a lot longer than a week. So, so okay. Whatever. Whatever. I don't know. I don't know if I'd want to know if I had a week left. Would Hell you? no. 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 Uh -uh. No. 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 That, that, that's the mysticism, right? We're not supposed to. I'm trying to stop trying to understand the things that I was never meant to understand. Exactly. Exactly. That, and that's what. The unexpected. It's the right. Unexpected. That, and that's what this book is about. It's about you won't understand everything. That's why I never tried or even implied what comes next is the book is not about the ending it's about the journey mm. to get yeah. there it's never going to be about if there is heaven if there is hell if there's a god or no god or whatnot it's not about that it's about the little moments the little deaths and the little grief and whether or not that you could actually turn that inward and make it into something better mm. And I want, we're going to open it up. There's a bunch of questions coming in for you, TJ. But before we go to questions, as a queer woman, I just have to say how much I deeply, deeply appreciate you writing beautiful queer stories. Just, Thank you. It, and not like, this is a gay book. Mm -hmm. you know, just write beautiful stories. And I, as much as it, it just fills my heart, but I also wanted to know, who else, you are the go-to author, but what other queer writers are out there right now that you think are doing really powerful work that if people want to expand in the LGBT Oh community? man, I'm so glad you asked that question because I could go on forever. But first, Rika Aoki, okay. uh, a trans author, released a book last week called Light from Uncommon Stars. I was fortunate enough to read it early and uh, blurb, which some, for some reason, ended up on the front cover, which is totally yeah. cool in its own way, right? <laughs> um, it is a marvel. I am, I am, I very rarely am I jealous of another author's work. I was jealous when I was <laughs> reading this book, but only if only Rika could have written this story. Only Rika could have, have done the, it, it is a mishmash of science fiction and fantasy. It is about Faustian bargains with the devil. It is about space travel. It is just, it is this wonderful concoction that, that I just was stunned by the time I finished. Um, and again, that is Light from Uncommon Stars by Rika Aoki. And that came out from Tor last week. I, I beg everyone to read this book. It, it was life-changing for me. It's honestly one of the best queer books of the last 10 years, probably uh, even longer than that. It is just, it is freaking amazing. Um, there is a book that comes out next year. And I think I read that it was in March. It is by a, uh, an author that I think was just shortlist or long listed, I think for the National Book Award, Anne-Marie McLemore has a book called oh my God, Lake Lore. I love them. I yeah, love them. Yeah. So they use they them pronouns. So we're going to make sure in case anybody's listening and, and wants clarification on Wild that. Wild Beauty use was just them. one of our book club picks. Yeah. Wild Beauty so is... Lake Lore comes out next year and it is the two main characters are two trans boys, one with ADHD and one with dyslexia. And their prose is just ridiculous. Ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And okay. I, it is a shorter novel. I think it's only 60,000 words, but holy crap. 
can they write? I had never read anything by them before. We had done a panel, uh, cause we, we had done a panel about uh, neurodivergence. Both of us have ADHD. And afterward they wrote to me and, and asked if I would read their book. And I said, okay, sure, we'll see what it's like. And then I read it and I was like, Jesus Christ, this is so wonderful. Um, I, yeah, it is, it is absolutely stunning. And that is Lake Lore and that comes out next March. And those are two of my favorite queer books that I've read in a very long time. And one other shout out I would like to give oh. is YA author, Julian Winters. He is a, uh, a queer BIPOC author who writes primarily YA. And if, for example, he wrote uh, Running with Lions, How to Be uh, Remy Cameron. And his books are filled with so much joy and heart that you walk away from every book, every book that I've read by him, I've walked away with a smile on my face because he is such a delight. And I've known, I've known Julian before he was a published author and to be able to witness his publishing journey has just been wonderful because he is a, a thunderous talent. And I, I am so proud of the work he does, but that's Julian Winters. And I hope that everybody reads his book too. Oh my gosh, that is a stellar lineup. So thank you very much. Probably going to see that on the Inky Phoenix soon. Um, <laughs> all right, let's, uh, I'm going to open it up to some questions. All right, TJ, this comes from Sandra. And they said, loved the book without spoilers. Was it hard to figure out how to wrap it up? Yes. <laughs> well, no, let me, let me, let me backtrack that a little bit. So I'm not going to spoil any part of the book. So please have no fear about that. The ending I know is going to be divisive to people. It will be. Um, I made the choice that I did because it was the book that I wanted to write. I don't write with anyone else in mind. I don't write, I don't write what I think readers are going to want to read because you will never make everyone happy. It's impossible. So I, when I write, I write what I want to write. And I knew that ending before I started. I knew where it was gonna go. I wasn't going to write toward that ending because things can change in when the process of writing a manuscript, but that ending um, was always gonna be that ending. I did, however, consider, and I'm not gonna say what it is, consider a different type of ending, but it was momentary. It, it was not something that, that lasted very long because the ending that I wrote is the ending that I wanted these characters to have. Okay, we're gonna have to talk off air because I want to hear about this other. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, this one is from Sarah. Who was the most difficult character to write and why? <sighs> so, <clears throat> I am a white dude, obviously, and um, the there are five what I would call five main characters in this book. There is Wallace, who is a white man. There is Apollo, who is a ghost dog. And then <laughs> there are Hugo, who's a black man, his grandfather, Nelson, who is a black man. And you have May, who's a Chinese American woman. So there is the um, school of thought that, the, and it can be very accurate that some authors, when they put characters of color in their book, they're basically slapping paint on the character, a white character and saying, you know, oh, look, I have representation. Yay, diversity points. I never wanna do that. If I'm going to commit to writing characters of color, I need to A, do right by my characters. I need to B, do right by my readers who could be from the communities I'm writing from. And C, I need to do right just because it's the right thing to do. You have to, if you're going to include characters of color and particularly when they are the, they fill out the main cast and there's only one white main character, I need to make sure that I'm doing my job correctly. The hardest character for me to write was Nelson. I knew Nelson was going to be sort of the comedic relief. I knew he was going to be there to cut Wallace down to size. I knew he was going to be there to be Hugo's touchstone, his, his guiding light, his rock, a person that he's known all his life and he loves his grandson dearly. Um, but Nelson, I, I desperately wanted to avoid any type of magical Negro trope. 
because yeah. we've seen how harmful that can be. And as much as it hurts me to say, one of my favorite authors in the entire world, Stephen King, has been guilty of that more than a few times with characters like Mother Abigail from The Stand, with John Coffey from Green Mile. Um, and you, you, can't, you need to know the harm that those tropes cause. So I went into this knowing who I wanted these characters to be. And so I talked with people in the community, in the communities, as I do, I talk to people in the communities I'm writing about. I talk to, um, I listen to many podcasts. I read lots of blog posts from, by, by uh, people of color. I look at when people of color break down tropes, specifically in this case, magical Negro trope and why it's harmful, mm. what it does to the community, where it came from and everything like that. And so I went into Nelson's character knowing that it was going to be a very tricky line to walk, thankfully, and as should be necessary, I think, across the entire publishing industry, I had some of the best sensitivity readers that I have ever had the pleasure of working with. Sensitive, sensitivity readers, for those not in the know, they are people from the community that the author is writing about. In this case, I had Black sensitivity readers and I had Chinese American sensitivity readers. And they... Sensitivity readers are not there to tear apart an author's work. They are there to hold an author accountable for the characters that they write. And for some reason, there seems to be a lot of discourse about whether sensitivity readers are necessary. And here I am to say, yes, they are. They are absolutely necessary. If you see an author saying that they don't use sensitivity readers or don't see the need for sensitivity readers, that's problematic. That is that, and I can't say that I, as a white person with privilege can't ever be problematic because let's be frank, I can be, we all can be. But when I see authors negating the need for such important jobs, it baffles my mind, it just blows my mind. So it was, I wanted, I wrote the words and the buck stops with me, but I wanna make sure that people know that there are sensitivity readers who work behind the scenes who deserve far more credit than they get. They deserve far more credit. They deserve to be heralded just as much as any author is because they are tremendous and they are absolutely vital. And this book would not be where it is without them. Kudos. <clears throat> Thank you for bringing that up. I think that's very important to anyone listening who's writing right now to keep that in mind mm -hmm. as they build their characters and worlds. Um, this and, one and just as a side note real quick too, if there's anybody watching that is writing and wondering where to get sensitivity readers. There are so many, um, I, what would I call them? Groups, firms, boutiques of, of that are specifically designed for sensitivity reading. And you can go to certain websites and you can pick out why you need a sensitivity reader and see if you can match with somebody who is from that community to be able to read the book. So it's not impossible to find people to give your book a look over to make sure that you are doing right by your character. So always, always seek out help and seek out advice and seek out somebody who is, who lives the characters that you're writing. Smart. Um, this one comes from Madeline. And uh, Madeline says, reading this book really helped me feel less alone. Thank you so much for writing it. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about your inspiration for Cameron and the Husks. Yeah, um, so, I'm gonna to try to keep this as spoiler free as possible. Um, Cameron is a lost soul in this book and they are called husks uh, because all of their humanity is gone. Um, not necessarily through any fault of their own. And in this case, it definitely was not through any fault of Cameron's own. He, as he says, just got lost. And I was Cameron at one point. And thankfully, I did not take the route that Cameron chose to take, again, through no fault of his own. Um, but I know how it feels to feel empty inside, to feel like you're a husk of a human being, that all you have is this outer shell that crumbles like paper mache. And Cameron was the biggest part of myself in this book. Um, and he, I wanted to give people... I wanted to give him and people like him who have made the, the difficult decision to uh, take their life. And it is um, 
when we think of, again, it goes back to the idea of such topics being taboo, but there's that line of thinking and, and it's, you know, basically deals with, comes from religion that those who die by suicide don't get to go to heaven. They go to hell. And that is, I mean, don't get me wrong. I have big problems with much of organized religion. Hello, queer man. But, <laughs> but I just think that the idea that someone who is so lost and doesn't see, can't find a way out and can't find the words to, to reach out to someone. And so they, they make that desperate decision. You, you have spiritual leaders saying these people are going to hell because of that. That just, there's so much wrong with, with that type of belief that I can't even begin to, to encompass all of it, but Cameron and his story was for people who have lost somebody in that regard, who have ever heard those words, that this person will not be able to enjoy any kind of everlasting life. And I wanted to say, screw you, because we absolutely will. It reminds me of when I was 18 years old and I went to my first pride parade. You know, I was so excited. I had beads around my neck and I was this, it was this 18 year old little twink who thought he was like the, the hot shit coming out. And there was a preacher said, and if you've been to a pride parade, you know, these type of people, there's preachers standing on the sidewalk with a bullhorn and signs that say, repent, gays are going to hell and, and blah, blah, blah. And he, I walked by him planning and he looked right at me and said, you are going to hell. And, you know, of course me being who I was, I laughed it off and kept on walking, but I just kept thinking just because of who I am, because of, of this is who I am. That's, that's your God. That's, that's your, that's what you think your God thinks. And then it just, I wanted to give people like us, queer people, people who have no way to move forward, people who are lost. I wanted to give them a place where they could be found. And that's what Cameron is all about. It's, I, um, I have to say that I not only cried at least three times reading this book, it, it, it was very similar to what grief has been in my life. It was so unexpected mm -hmm. that it came out of me in waves. Yeah. I don't know if your intention was to write a, a book about grief too, then actually like I felt the grief move into my body, but in be beautiful, like Cameron's story is heart-wrenching and stunning and and you you landed giving the voice and beauty to someone who deserves it that it's often yeah. so frequently stripped away from it is because if, if you if you go if you look out in the world if you ever hear news stories about people who die by suicide either because they're connected to somebody famous or maybe they are famous too in some way shape or form you always hear about their ending yeah but not really who they were as a person you know and it it's it sucks that that's the, I mean, of course, but bad news sells no matter what, that we know that, but yeah. people are more than what their ending is. They had, they had entire lives and maybe that life was hard. Maybe that life, obviously it would be if it led to them going in the direction that they did, but people are so much more than their ending and they should be treated as such and they should be respected and loved as such, even if they do make a difficult choice like that. And suffering is not selfish. No, no, oh, that's selfish. Yeah, you, you hear you hear the those that say death by suicide. It's such a selfish yeah, move. What, selfish. what do you? Like, come on, man. That's yeah. <laughs> oh man. This conversation is getting heated now. Now I'm getting mad. <laughs> Going for it. <laughs> Screw it. <laughs> um, I'm gonna ask another question, but I just want to remind everyone who's listening right now: if you don't have the book by now, obviously, yeah, want to get a copy. Um, there are signed copies available at Midtown Scholar online, so you can go onto the website and you can snag a personalized, signed, well, not personalized, but signed copy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get people think the wrong thing. Um, okay, this one comes from Jenna, and I wanted to ask this too. Jenna said, I love the book covers from House in Cerulean Sea and Under the Whispering Door. Can you talk a little bit about the artist illustrations and the creative process and perhaps how involved you are in the decision making? Absolutely. So these are not illustrations. 
This is by a man who is named Chris Sickles. He is the owner of Red Nose Studios. And this, all of this is real. He built this from the ground up, the house, the trees, uh, the, the, and then if you look at the house in the Cerulean Sea cover, all of this, the ocean, the cliff, the house, the sunset, all of this is real. He built these models and did the backgrounds. All of this is at 100% real. I actually have- Do you own this, them? This, I have this model sitting on my desk. Yeah, it is, he sent it to me. Can we see um, it? After, yeah, give me just, if you can give me just one sec. Yeah, totally. This is, we're just gonna do this. Let's do this. I, mean, I think this is pretty exciting, y'all. I don't know about you. We're going to see the real thing. Look at that. Uh-uh. So, this is something that he sent to me um, after. And it's the house, and it has a scooter. Now watch the top, the fourth floor. The light comes on. <gasps> <laughs> oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, he made this for me. This is the model that you see on the cover. And it now sits on my writing desk so I get to see it every day. And you see the little scooter comes off. Wow. Yeah, so he makes these, um, he builds these. He is such a tremendous talent. You should follow him on, on Instagram, especially at Red Nose Studios. Red Nose um, Studios? Okay. Yeah, because he is, he is, I mean, you see movies like uh, Coraline and, and Nightmare Before Christmas. He is making these things in real life. These are real things that he does. And he is so supremely talented. And I will work with him forever if he'll allow me to, because he is such a tremendous artist. But I think he um, might be okay with that. <laughs> yeah. So I, the house in the Australian Sea had a different cover at first. It was going to have a different cover, I should say. But the powers that be decided it wasn't whimsical enough, I guess. So they went to Chris and they sent me this um, rough sketch. It was just this pencil rough sketch and, and it was of a house on a cliff. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, well, I, get, I don't know where he's going with this, so I'll see it. And then they sent me that final cover. I was like, holy shit, I will never doubt anyone ever again when it comes to him. <laughs> so when he decided to do um, Under the Whispering Door, the only feedback or the only input I gave because I trusted him was I needed the stag to be somewhere in the book, in the cover. And then we kind of started talking back and forth and the idea of having the stag's antlers look like the limbs from the trees just was born. Yeah. And so that is where that came from. It's, I'm very lucky to work with people like him who I can give basic information of what I'm looking for and then have him go do whatever he wants with it and make it look even better than I could have described. Right, that level of trust with an artist yeah. is everything, everything. Yeah, it's very um, nice. All right, this one, thank you for sharing that. That's so special. Yeah. I, the fact that that exists in your home, <laughs> so good. I'm like, okay, where's Chossie? Come on, where is right, he? Right, right, right. He's he over on my desk too. <laughs> um, okay, speaking of Chauncey, so this is from Allison. Allison said, Catherine is so right. Mm -hmm. I yeah. carry your characters around with me. I mean, I still think about Chauncey at least once a day. Mm -hmm. Do you want your books to get turned into movies? Would you wish for them to be animated or not? And they are so cinematic and vivid and filled with heart. Thank you for writing them. Thank you for saying that. Um, I'm going to be very careful with what I say next. I can't, I can't, Good. yeah. So infer what you want out of that. But I will say that the idea of these um, either of these books being adapted is obviously would be a dream come true, but I, if they were to be adapted, I would love to see them in the animated medium. I would love to see a stop motion like House or like uh, Nightmare Before Christmas and Coraline for um, the House in the Cerulean Sea. I think that that would be absolutely amazing, and I would love to see an animated version of Under the Whispering Door um, in the style of like Studio Ghibli, who did. Uh, uh, Spirited Away and Princess Mononoke and all these wonderful films, but one of their best is Diana Wynne, the adaptation of Diana Wynne Jones' Howl's Moving Castle, which is one of my favorite books of all time. And they adapted that into an animated film that is just absolutely gorgeous. And I would love, they do traditional hand-drawn animation and I would love to see a hand-drawn animated 
version of Under the Whispering Door because I love, you know, don't get me wrong, 3D animated films are wonderful and they're technologically impressive, but there's just something I, I love about the hand-drawn color cells of, of, right, it's of so Snow White and, 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 and Cinderella and then all the way up into the Disney Renaissance area of, of like Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast and all of that. I love hand-drawn animation and I think that that would translate really well. And okay, so let's just stay on this for a moment, fantasizing about this. Do you have someone, not oh I guess, an active <laughs> voice? Who would you want to voice Wallace? Would you ever consider voicing a character? No, no, no. uh-uh, no, uh-uh. I, I, I would want to stay far away from that as I could, as much as I could. You know, I'd love to see it happen, but I've told the stories I wanted to tell. And if somebody else wants to take a crack at adapting it, that's totally fine. I would not want to do voices. I would not want to do, I'll go to the premiere. That would be cool to do something uh, like that. But um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. It would have to be, who's good at being a curmudgeon? Like I, I could think- Christopher ben Walken. Oh, nice. No, uh, I think he'd be too old. Like maybe Benedict Cumberbatch. In an, in, oh, in, a, in an yes. American voice with just his flat delivery. Yes. <gasps> I think that he would be good at doing uh, a Wallace. Let's call him. Let's okay, him we up. will do. Have, have, have your people call his people because my people aren't big enough yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. All right, this one comes from Derek. And Derek wants to know, so much queer fiction today is intertwined with mental health struggles. TJ was introduced as being passionate and positive about representation of the LGBTQIA plus community in stories. How do you, TJ, balance this intersection of queer storytelling with mental health difficulties? For example, anxiety, depression, and or suicide are often included in these stories. Is it problematic or is it perhaps important and necessary to include? I think it's important and necessary to include. The reason being, as I said before, is that we don't talk about, um, about mental health struggles specifically within the queer community as much as we need to. Um, there is a lot, if you are of a certain age, say if you were born in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s, and you came of age being queer, there's a lot of trauma that comes with growing up during that time of being queer. If you, if you, if you were in of age in the 80s, you know the AIDS crisis that decimated a community. If, if you were in the 90s, you saw Don't Ask, Don't Tell and, and how that would affect families. And the, uh, all I think about is how in my 20s, when I basically was out of high school and ha had come out, kicked that freaking closet door down and came out with a chip on my shoulder, I couldn't help but mourn all the things I never got to have. I never got to take a boy to prom. I never got to have a first kiss uh, after, or sneaking a first kiss during lunch of like between the first and second bell in ninth grade. I never got to do anything like that. And I think that what a lot of people don't realize, you know, I'm not saying that it's, I won't say that it's much easier for queer kids coming up now, but there was a big difference between then and now. And I think that we sometimes forget that, that some that a lot of that trauma is still with a lot of us about what we had to do. I mean, I grew up in a very poor conservative area in rural Oregon, and I was a loudmouth, effeminate kid with ADHD. So you can imagine how that would go over in a community where everybody had a gun and a hunting truck and a truck that they also had parked in the yard that didn't drive anymore because you would use that to shoot at. And that's just the kind of, yeah, that's the kind of place that I grew up in. So I could never be myself without fear of retribution. So when I write about mental health issues, when I write about issues affect, that I think affect the queer community, it's done so out of a place of love, it's done out of a place of understanding, but it's also done out of a place of trying to expand knowledge for others who may not be in the community or who may not understand what it was like coming of age in a time where the majority of the people in your country hated you for who you were. I mean, if you think about it, if you really think about it, it's only been six years since we could get legally married in this country nationwide. It has only been six years. So I will continue to write about 
stuff that I think we need to continue talking about, and that includes mental health. But I will do so respectfully, and I will do so with not to, again, sensationalize, because that is the worst kind of thing that you could do when speaking on such topics. So I do it when I do it, I do it because it's something that affects people every single day. And it's something that we need to talk more about, especially in this country where, I mean, I don't even need to get going on the state of healthcare in this country and the people who, and the people who need the mental health service the most are the ones who can't get it. I, I know, gosh, there's so much I wanna to talk to you about now, but I, yeah. I, I, I think what you just said where only within the past six years, six years could we get married and, and thank you for putting queer stories out in a non um, co-opted non-capitalistic mm -hmm. way, you know, because I think people who are not part of the LGBTQ community often look at us and think, oh, you're great now. Like, you can Oh yeah, we, after, after the Obergefell Everybody decision came out, you. after the Obergefell decision came out, I remember like seeing just like, it was, you know, it was probably just a, a an asshole on, on Twitter basically saying, well, gays can do what everybody else can. I guess that means homophobia is over. Yeah. It was like, yeah. <laughs> and then the very next year when a certain former president came into power, I mean, I was in the parking lot at a grocery store and some redneck in his truck drove by and called me a faggot because he saw my, my uh, pride bumper sticker on my car. So, I mean, yay, we can get married and homophobia is over. Not, 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 that's not how that works. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So thank you for putting these stories out. And before we wrap out, one more time, everybody, signed copies are available. I'm a town scholar. Please go check that out and buy one for yourself and everybody that you know. And um, TJ, do you have any parting words for your readers that you want I do. to? So this book is about grief, yes. And it is about self-discovery and making amends and becoming a better person. This book can be whatever you want it to be. It can be a just a story. It could be a window opening up for you to just take a look through to see how you feel about the idea of death and grief, or it could be a mirror. It could be something that you could look at your own reflection and say, what would I do with the time of, that I have left? And I think it's something that we need to ask ourselves, what should we do with the time we have left to make this world better than when we found it? I'm... <laughs> I can't follow that up. Um, Cut it, kill it, we're done. <laughs> um, this was delightful. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, TJ. Thank you, Catherine, for being here with me. And thank you, Midtown Scholar, for hosting us. Of course, yeah. Um, once again, as Catherine was mentioning, signed copies of Under the Whispering Door are available through the Midtown Scholar bookstore. Look in the chat room. I've brought a link there for you or simply head to our website, midtownscholar.com. Thank you to our audience members and everyone who tuned in. Thank you for your question. We had, we had really great questions tonight. So thanks again. And um, uh, any last words? Check on people who you love that you may not have heard from a little while. They may need you to, they need somebody to talk to. Yes. Mm -hmm. And read more books that come from TJ and authors like <laughs> we need to, there's so, I, we have so much hard work to do, but we need to remember stories of love and we need to remember stories that uplift us. And that is the fuel that we need to keep putting in our systems if we are going to be the change that we want to see out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Read more books. Have a good night, yeah. everyone. Bye.